Welcome to Women's Wellness with Joanne. Today's show, Laughter, the Best Medicine. We've all heard those stories of how people have taken lemons and made lemonades. We are privileged today that we actually have one of those women on our show. Diagnosed with breast cancer in December of 94, she has gone on and written 11 award-winning books telling her story entitled Now, not now, I'm having a no hair day, <laughs> laugh until it heals, notes from the funniest cancer mailbox, and her new book, which I'm really excited to talk about, How Can I Help Giving and Receiving Kindness and Caring If You or Someone You Love Has Cancer, Christine Clifford. I am so excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Joanne. Thank you. I, before we go into your story, I really just wanted to um, talk about before you were diagnosed. So here you are, a very powerful woman. You are actually the senior executive vice president of the SPA Group an international information and merchandising service, services firm in New York, the top salesperson in a multi-billion dollar industry, responsible for accounts that we all are very familiar with, Kmart, Procter & Gamble, AT&T, Mattel Toys, Revlon, just to name a few. <laughs> and, uh, and, Makes me tired yeah. just listening to it. <laughs> and then, so this, this is the woman that you are, and then that December comes, and your diagnosis of breast cancer. What was that like, if you don't mind sharing your story? Well, it was as if my life had come to a screeching halt. I, I had felt like I was on a treadmill for many years because of the busyness of that job and my family and so on and so forth. Then all of a sudden, the treadmill stops and you have to step off and go, wow, what is happening to me? It was, um, it was quite devastating. I was young, 40 years old. I had young children, a family. Um, but it didn't come as a complete surprise to me either because I have a family history of breast cancer, which I think we're going to yeah. talk about a little bit today, too. So, uh, you know, just like anyone of any age, any, you know, male, female children, it's a devastating diagnosis, no question about it. Absolutely. So here you are, you're a, you're a senior executive vice president. This was your world. You get your breast cancer diagnosis. And now you have devoted, <laughs> I know because it's amazing, you've devoted your career to helping others find the humor in the cancer experience, which is amazing all in itself. But how did you find the humor in your journey? Well, that's a really good question, Joanne, because um, my... I was feeling sorry for myself, actually, because of having witnessed my mother go through breast cancer at a very early age as well. And I was lying in bed three days after having surgery, and I hadn't started chemotherapy or radiation therapy yet, but our doorbell rang. And my youngest son, Brooks, who was only eight years old at the time, answered the doorbell and yelled up the stairs to me, Mom, more flowers for your breast. <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing. And I remember lying there in bed thinking, oh my gosh, this feels so good to laugh. And I had thought I would never laugh again. So I realized that I was going to be able to find humor in my situation again. And that was kind of a turning point for me. Oh, that's wonderful. Leave it to the children to, exactly. to like, show us something that we needed to know. I, I know I'm always asked to speak to someone who's newly diagnosed, who's going through, you know, cancer, and I, I find it difficult. So, you know, like I have to, 
you know, almost uh, prepare myself before I have a cup of coffee with someone who is going through or just received a cancer diagnosis and what I'm going to say, what I'm not going to say. But what I found really interesting is that you, you said, you know, like, how to speak to someone with humor that's been diagnosed and like what is your icebreaker idea i love that you you happen to mention that i wouldn't even know like where to be like i said it's something that i i struggle with when i know i'm going to have to meet with someone but i would love to be able to walk in with you know and and have that person just smile instantly with something well for first of all um just walking in and seeing a person is a day brightener. I can't tell you how alone and isolated you feel when you're diagnosed with cancer because it's, it's a surreal feeling. You look around you, everybody else at the party is laughing and having cocktails and telling stories about their life and you're sitting there internally kind of going, I have cancer, I have cancer, I have cancer. So any type of reaching out to someone who has cancer to me is a gift. Um, as far as bringing humor into their life, I'm very cautious about it as much as I'm a proponent of it because everyone has a different sense of humor. So what's very funny to somebody is not funny at all to somebody else or it can even be offensive to somebody else. So I found that self-deprecating humor Making all the stories and jokes about myself and what I was going through made other people laugh because it wasn't directed at them. It was something that had actually happened to me, like telling the story about my son, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yelling up the stairs to me or something. But one of the things I always try to do with somebody diagnosed with cancer is to research and find out through family and friends of theirs what type of humor do they like. And then I'll try to go out and find something that fits into that category of what would make them laugh. Absolutely. So turning it basically on to myself and my experience. Right. Be, yeah, that, I could see that. And I know I have a lot of those funny things with yeah. the children, too. Because yes. mine were quite little when I was diagnosed. I remember my, my daughter, we, she was in kindergarten. And I just started chemo, lost all my hair, put on a wig. And I had a mommy, you know, like... We, we were allowed in the classroom. Um, and my daughter walks in front of everyone. She's like, I know what's on your head. <laughs> you know? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. No Thanks one else. Pointing. Yeah, hello. I know <laughs> no one's met me and no one else knows, but now we all do. That's a cute story. I wish I, wish I had that in one of my books. That's a cute story. She's, uh, yeah, leave it to her. It was pretty. Uh, <laughs> but now we have your new book here. And um, I, this is fascinating to me. So, yes, I have a lot of women that, you know, um, and they really struggle with, um, you know, like, how can I help someone? Or, and I have a lot of the cancer survivors that struggle with accepting help. And, yes. And, you know, yes. And, and I'm just like, don't worry about it. You know, if someone says, I want to come over and clean, let them because right. you really don't have the energy to do it. And also, that might be someone's way of helping. Uh, you know, like, you know, because I don't bake, so I'll never come over with cookies. <laughs> You know, but I can straighten up for you. Right. I don't mind wiping down the bathroom, you know, once in a while. But so tell us a little bit about your book. I would love to, to know. And Well, thank you, Joanne. I think the primary reason that I wrote it is because everybody that um, finds out someone they love has, that has cancer, they, they truly don't know what to say. And they don't want to say the wrong thing. So oftentimes they end up saying nothing. Exactly. They, they withdraw. Um, I actually have had experiences twice where I was walking in a grocery store. Someone I knew was walking straight at me. I know they saw me and they turned and walked in another direction because they just don't know what to say. So that's very normal. It's f totally very normal. Very normal. So anyone out there who's going through uh, treatment and has, you know, you know who your real friends are, that's not really the case at all. It, it is really not. comes down to they don't know what to say, right. and it's just easier to say nothing. But very so normal. So I, I found if I started using humor that that broke down barriers. And let me give you some examples. Most people feel comfortable reaching out to a newly diagnosed cancer patient or someone in long-term treatment with what I call silent gestures of support. They'll send a card. They'll 
send flowers. They will even drop a meal or those cookies off on your front porch without ever even ringing your doorbell. They just set it there because they don't know what to say. So what I started doing is I took my cartoons from my very first book, the Not Now I'm Having a No Hair Day book, and I was drawing cartoons about true, every one of the cartoons is a true experience of something that happened to me. So if someone would send me flowers, silent gesture of support, I would draw one of those, the cartoon of my son, mm -hmm. you know, mom, more flowers for your breast, on a card, write a thank you note, and mail it to them. And then guess what happened? Get the they would pick the phone up and call me and say, Christine, where did you find this cartoon? This is hysterical. And I'd say, well, you know, I drew it and, you know, so on and so forth. And I did the same with meals. I had a cartoon of my uh, dog looking out the door and someone is standing there with food and the cartoon bubble is the dog saying, not lasagna again, <laughs> you know, and I would do that if someone dropped off food. And it opened up the actual conversation and then within a short period of time, the word spread throughout my community that, oh my gosh, Christine Clifford has cancer, but boy, does she have a good attitude. Well, I don't even know if I had a good attitude, Joanne. I, I certainly didn't come from a background that would have given me a good attitude about this, but that became contagious for me. And, I, and all of a sudden I thought, I'm going to have a good attitude and I'm gonna embrace every day you know, as if it's my last and live my life and, and do the best I can. Absolutely. I think when we were talking, you happened to mention to me that you really were never um, an artist or you, you, know, you got up in the middle of the night, you had an idea and you went downstairs and just started doodling. Because, you know, like coming from an executive to being a comic author, it's... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally out of the twilight zone. But the, the experience that I related to you, which I'll relate to your listeners, is that um, it was six weeks after my first diagnosis. So I had had surgery and I was doing chemotherapy and radiation at the same time because my cancer was so aggressive and stage three and all that. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, went downstairs into my office and on the spot, sketched 50 cartoons about things that people had said to me or done to me or I had done to myself that seemed whimsical and humorous. And I had never drawn before, never. And I wasn't the person at the party telling the jokes all the time. You know, I had a good sense of humor. But then I went back up to bed pulled the sheets under my chin and thought, what was that? I mean, I really freaked myself out because I'm thinking, what was all that? So I got up the next morning and I went both to my city's public library and a Barnes and Noble. And I walked in, walked right up to the information counter and said, I'd like to see all of your humorous books on cancer, please. And both of the reactions of the people that were serving me ended up being cartoons in Not Now I'm Having a No Hair Day, which was the first gentleman literally peered at me over his glasses and said, humorous book about cancer, you're sick. And I thought, hello, <laughs> I have cancer. And I pulled a little notepad out of my purse and I wrote that down. And then I went across the street to the library and the librarian actually got on her computer and dragged me down into the lower level of the uh, um, library and took me to the shelf and pointed up to the top and said, there it is, the humorous book on cancer. So that became a cartoon in, in the book. Um, and that was a book written by Irma Bombeck okay. about her breast cancer experience. But it was all written prose. So my cartooning, I realized, had never been done before. And that was the beginning of a life-changing career for me. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of where I was leading with that because I find it amazing that, you know, a lot of people, you get a cancer diagnosis and I always say it will change your life forever. You know, it's just 
things that you value, what, whatever right. it is, things that you experience, it completely changes your life. And you're like prime example of that, you know, business executive to, you know, author comic. And uh, how a person who never drew before now doing all these doodles. And I, I just find that fascinating. <laughs> but you've done so much more. So when we say taking lemons and making lemonade, I mean, you've done a lot of lemonade. <laughs> yeah, I can't even, it's, it's amazing. It's, so you started and you're the president and the chief executive officer for the Cancer Club. Yes. So tell us a little bit about this Cancer Club. Well, because I came from such a strong sales and marketing background, um, again, I'm searching for ways that people can reach out to me and ways I can then start passing it on and reaching out to others. I realized that in a whole year, no one ever gave me a product that had the word cancer on it or was actually developed for a cancer patient. So I, I thought, I want to start marketing humorous and helpful products for people with cancer. So my very first product was um, more on the helpful side. The, back in the day, mm -hmm. we're talking in the early 90s, there was not any type of exercise program for breast cancer patients. So I wrote, directed, produced, ah. and starred in a video called One Move at a Time exercise for women recovering from breast cancer surgery. And then, uh, so that was our very first product. And then I successfully, because of my marketing background, sold about 75,000 copies of that wow. to a pharmaceutical company who gave them away for free to oncology clinics and hospitals all over the country. So it was a win-win for right. everybody. And then when my first book came out, Not Now I'm Having a No Hair Day, I took a lot of those cartoons and put them on calendars and coffee mugs and you know all the typical gimmicky things but now someone could actually go buy something for someone that that acknowledged that broke the elephant in the room kind of feeling that you had cancer so that's how the company began Amazing. I know because I did I did go over and, and I was looking through the website, but yeah, but that's adorable too when you think about it. It's like if you're going to give someone a gift and you know the situations like you said, there's so many of them and it's actually on a mug and it's personable for both of them. Right. What a wonderful idea. Oh, thanks. I love that idea. And then so and so also you did you appeared on CNN, which I was like as leading as the world's leading authority on therapeutic humor, which is like amazing that it's like, why didn't people think about just, you know, like laughter being great medicine, like prior to this for cancer patients? Well, there was a whole movement out there. Um, there is an association called the American Association for Applied and Therapeutic Humor, and I became a member of it. And there were doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists and nurses and all kinds of people in this association who had devoted their careers to studying the physiological effects of laughter and humor on the body. And um, so it, it was out there, but I don't think common people heard about it too yeah. much. You know, I certainly wasn't aware that there was any kind of activity around this topic. Today, I mean, my gosh, they have TV shows and have made, you know, full length feature films on people recovering from cancer. And, you know, so many more celebrities today speak about their cancer experiences where back in the 90s and certainly back when my mother was diagnosed many years ago, nobody said the word cancer. No. You know, you didn't want to tell people you had cancer. It was like the scarlet letter on your front door, you know. So uh, I'm really proud of that fact that I really became one of the first pioneers yes. and certainly the pioneer of cartoon books on cancer. Yes. And now again, there's lots of them out there, which is wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful. Yeah. I know because I, uh, 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago when I was diagnosed, I didn't say it was cancer. It was, I, it was one of those that we, we didn't right. say. And I know how, you were very young when your mom was diagnosed, you imagine. 15 years 15 old years when she old. was diagnosed and 19 when she passed. So sorry about that. So yeah, it was a long, long, and ba I mean, back then, honestly, people did not support her. They didn't have all the organizations we have in our country today. 
um, that you know, with walks and marches and, and pink ribbons, pink and, ribbons and you know, she was really alone. She was very much alone. And I knew that I didn't want to tr to do what she had done, right. which was crawl into bed, even though there's four kids in the family, and never come out. She never came out. She was clinically depressed. Again, they didn't know too much about how to treat clinical depression back in those days relating to breast cancer, other than to medicate. Right. And um, I just knew I wanted, I, 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 I've often felt that I had to see my mother go through her experience for me to have come out on the other side and embrace my cancer and just say, you know, I can't go back and change what's happened to me, but what I can do is have a positive attitude about it. Absolutely, and make this lemonade, like we so mentioned. <laughs> Absolutely. I know, because you've been featured, so since your diagnosis, you've done, you've accomplished so much, but you've also been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Better Homes and Garden, More Magazine, Self, uh, American Health, uh, Golf Digest. You, you've done, you've accomplished so many things since your diagnosis. I mean, you've raised, because I love this number, it's huge. So for breast cancer research, you've raised over $1 million. Yes, I, I held a celebrity golf tournament up in Minneapolis for, in four years, we raised a million dollars. And then I probably would have kept doing it forever, but the country club where we held the event uh, closed for a two-year renovation. And by then, you know, my committee kind of scattered and all this stuff. But I continue to serve and raise money. I'm on the board of the Southwest Florida Susan G. Komen Foundation, okay. and I attend lots of fundraisers all over the country. I still go out and speak at fundraisers. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm confident that one day we will find a cure. Absolutely, so am I, absolutely. So you shared with me one of your quotes from your book, and I felt that it was so inspiring, so moving, and it kind of almost wraps up really what I wanted for women's wellness, that it's about completing the whole woman, not just our physical you know, well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind sharing your quote with the audience? I just feel coming from you, it would be just so that they could hear your quote. <laughs> uh, I think we talked about the one that's, um, a shared gift of laughter is a priceless gift to the spirit. Absolutely, it is so beautiful, so inspiring. I loved it when you sent it to me. I was like, I have to make sure that we mention that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, your advice for anyone that's recent, been recently diagnosed with cancer, do you have any advice for those women? I have lots of advice yes. <laughs> for those women, men and women, okay. you know, men and women, any type of cancer. Number one is to research all of the possibilities. There's so much more access. I mean, can you imagine, you know, when I was going through this, we barely had email, you know, at that time. We didn't have access to the internet. Um, there's so many new protocols and um, clinical trials and things going on you know, throughout our country that I recommend that you research everything to the nth degree and always get second, if not third opinions. Because I always say that every individual um, physician or nurse working in oncology is an artist. It's an art form what they put together for you and think is the best possible treatment path for you. But you might go see another doctor who has a completely different path and a completely different canvas and a completely different idea. And a third might even more so. So in the end, with the knowledge that you have and the information that you have gathered and the support of your family and friends, you need to make a decision this is the path that I'm going to follow. And I'm not even going to ever question that I didn't follow another path. This is my journey, and I'm going to stick to it. So that's number one, research all the possibilities. Number two plays right into this book, How Can I Help? Don't ever be afraid to ask people for help. The love and support that they want to give you, seriously and sincerely want to give you, can absolutely get you through a cancer experience on a day-to-day -day basis. 
people want to know, they feel helpless, you know, when you've become a cancer patient and they want to do something, you know, so give them this, uh, uh, an idea out of this book or, you know, throw out something that you need done. Oh my gosh, I just got diagnosed. It's December 19th. My Christmas decorations are up. And, you know, when Christmas is over, please come over and help yeah. my family take them down. Anything. Uh, and lastly, my biggest piece of advice, it's the trademark of our company, is don't forget to laugh. Yes. <laughs> I, have to, I have to admit, every time, you know, when we go back and forth and there's a couple times where I've left a message and that's on the, uh, the very last thing that you say on your voicemail. <laughs> and it actually does make me laugh when, and I, I end up smiling like after I hang up. It's, it's yeah, don't forget to laugh. Exactly. Yeah. Wonderful advice. Thank you so much. And so your books, uh, you know, if anyone wants to get one of your books or, you know, because I think they would make an amazing gift, um, they could easily go to your website, which they I can believe, go to the website. Yes. They can go to Amazon, Barnes Amazon. and Noble, you know, any place that sells books, bookstores. Um, so they're available. Yes, and again, it's Christine Clifford, and we have the website up. You can go to christineclifford.com or thecancerclub.com. Um, also, you can go down and visit my Facebook page. It's Women's Wellness with Joanne. Um, and you'll ha we'll have this again on Terrific. that. Yes, and you could get all the names of all the other books that we happen to mention, um, and we'll link it back and forth. But I want to say thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and all that you've done, all that you've accomplished. You know, thank you for being here and sharing with all our viewers. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Joanne, thank and you. kudos to you yes, for being thank a 15-year thank you. Survivor. survivor. Good yes. for you. Thank many, you. many more healthy years years ahead of thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to uh, METV, and uh, thank you for joining us at Women's Wellness. Visit our Facebook page, Women's Wellness with Joanne. Thank you.